Well, thanks for joining me, Denise. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, let's kind of give everyone a little bit of a background of your journey through, you know, sports and business over the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll give you kind of the high level version and I'll start way back, you know, a little bit um, way back when. Um, I'm actually originally from the West Coast, which is kind of part of my journey because I haven't li I've lived in a ton of different cities and I've lived all over the country. So I grew up in Seattle and for college wanted to just get out of the rain. And so my parents <laughs> saw that there was an opportunity and at the time out of state tuition at the University of Arizona was reasonable. And so they say, well, you can go there, or the University of Washington, or you have to get tons of scholarships to go to these private schools you want to go to in California. And I said, well, sign me up for the desert. Um, I accepted. And literally my first time there was freshman orientation. And I was like, that's fine. I just want to get out of the rain. I want to go to the sun. So, so you didn't even do like a visit before that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was like, I don't care where it is. I just want to be in the sun. Um, but for me, that's kind of what started my career journey to being in sports. So we didn't have a traditional sports management or sports marketing major when I was there, but being a, someone that grew up around sports, played a ton of sports, loved sports, I realized I wasn't ever going to be able to play professionally or in college, um, but I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to be around it. That atmosphere just fires me up and I love it. So I got, um, I went into the business school and then I got heavily involved in the athletic department and realized that you could get paid to really work around sports and be a part of sports. So I was very lucky to be um, at the University of Arizona during some great um, basketball runs. It was a lot of fun. And I was very involved on the court, on the field for football, and wanted to get involved. Well, unfortunately, um, my interview process outside of college was not so great. And I got overlooked by people with more sales experience and interns for teams. And so I was like, forget this industry. I'm going back to what I know. And at that point, it was... Um, you know, Nordstrom, and I worked on the sales floor at Nordstrom, and that's kind of how I, you know, learned my sales experience. So I went back to the corporate office and for a year, and that was a great year for me to just kind of learn corporate, you know, the corporate world. And I eventually got back into um, trying to attack the sports world after a year of that. And I was lucky enough to go through some training with Game Face, which now is a different form of a company, but i um, ever grateful for Rob Cornelis and his team who trained me. And then I got my first opportunity in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and a little girl that, you know, grew up in Seattle, went to school in Arizona, going to Pittsburgh, my dad was like, what are you doing? Like, and I said, don't worry, this is what I'm going to do. It's going to be okay. And um, it was a great opportunity and experience for me. So I sold for the Pittsburgh Pirates for two and a half years. Um, found my success wasn't necessarily directly in the city. I was finding success in the greater region because I wasn't from Pittsburgh. So it didn't matter to me if they were from Wheeling, West Virginia, Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and that actually helped me and I grew into a management role. And unfortunately, I was the one of seven managers reporting to a director and at the time realized that, you know, I loved coaching and training people, but I wasn't getting the support that I needed and it wasn't the fault of my director. It was just the way that we were structured. And so, um, lo and behold, a couple opportunities came to the forefront and that's when I made my jump to Atlanta. So, um, I did not want to move to Atlanta <laughs> after being in the airport and being caught in the airport one time. I was like, I'm never it's the worst there. airport. Worst um, airport. If, you're, if it's your home airport, it's not bad. But when you're connecting, which I got stuck connecting there and had to drive from Atlanta to Pittsburgh with a fellow um, co-worker who was coming back from spring training one year. I was like, I'm never living in this city. Well, lo and behold, <laughs> never say never because I, yeah. I moved and I lived there. And, um, you know, Atlanta, I was very, very fortunate in Atlanta to work for some amazing people in our industry. And I learned so much in my years there. Initially, I was um, the manager of group sales, got promoted to director of group sales, led that team when we had the two teams. So the Atlanta Hawks and the Thrashers at the time. And then um, when we made the transition and sold off the Thrashers, I was um, able to transition into marketing and spend my last, I guess, four and a half years there, essentially as the director of marketing. Um, for family reasons, we decided that it was better to move closer to um, some family. And so that's what led me up to Michigan. So um, at the time, my husband's family is from here. And so we decided to make the move up here. And over the course of that, I re kind of reinvented what I wanted to do in the industry and um, jumped into Spinzo. And so I've been with Spinzo for over four years, almost four and a half years now. Um, and it's a totally different aspect of our industry being on the vendor side versus the team side. But um, again, a learning opportunity and a growth opportunity for me. 
So I kind of gone all over the country, but I like to showcase that because it's a, it's a very unique, it's part of our industry, but sometimes unique too. Yeah, it is. It's, it, you almost have to, to kind of get, get in and get going. And then for advancement, a lot of times, if you want to accelerate that, you do have to kind of move around. What, so what was it like though? I mean, moving the whole way across the country, you're just out of college. It has to be somewhat scary not knowing anybody there. You know, it was, um, but for me, I, I was very goal oriented. I was very eyes on the prize. Like I was there to work. I was there to, you know, advance my career. And um, I will say, I mean, I had a few friends outside of the office, but most of my friends were in the office and I spent, especially working in major league baseball. <laughs> like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, you have some free times, but you don't really have a whole lot of free time, especially from April to September. I yeah. lived at the ballpark. No I life. Would, yeah. Where I'd go in at seven in the morning. I'd work all day. I would go work out at five o'clock. I, we had an Outback in the, um, in the ballpark. So I would order dinner from Outback after working out, go pick it up and come back to my desk and sit at my desk till 7 PM. But I loved it. That's what I, I, you know, that's what I signed up for. And that's what I loved. And you know, you don't have to do that to be successful, but that was my mode of operation. So I know that uh, you had mentioned that you're a single mother. How old are your kids? You have three? So yeah, I have three kids. I have a nine-year-old girl and then I have twins that are six and a half. So I have a very busy household. <laughs> How do you juggle that? <sighs> Some days better than others. Um, but <laughs> I think, you know, for me, that was the big change of leaving the team side of sports for me. Um, I, you know, I was realizing that, you know, I was paying someone to watch or to be with my children more than I was being with them. And so what was so great about Spinzo for me was the opportunity to work from home. So yes, I work a, a lot of hours and I put a lot of time in, but I have to, you know, I have to plan my day around them. So, you know, I'm up early, I get some work in and some me time in before I transition into, you know, mom mode and my kids are going back to school face to face, which is really exciting next week. But, you know, by 7am I transition to getting them ready for school and, and making lunches and breakfast and all those things. And, drop them off to school and then come back and do my work. So it's just, it's, it's a whole lot of being, you know, really organized and a lot of time management. And, you know, I, there are times where at 9 PM, I have to jump back on my computer and finish up stuff and other people are sitting and watching Netflix, you know, and I found that, you know, after becoming a mom and being in this industry, I used to love, like, I mean, especially in college, like you asked me anything about specific sports. I knew facts and stats and all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'm lucky if I watch one game a week right now, you know, I mean, I check up on the scores and I watch the highlights, but I just don't have the time. So, you know, it's, it's possible. It's just, it's a juggling act and you really have to be, um, you know, on your game day in and day out. So when you were in Atlanta, it's kind of, I, I don't, I wouldn't say it's really normal to go from, you know, sales role to marketing. So kind of, how did that all transpire and, and how was that transition for you? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I, because there wasn't a sports management or marketing um, degree when I was at the University of Arizona, I got a degree in marketing. And actually, initially, part of what I wanted to do was plan events. Like I really wanted, and I didn't necessarily want to be in sales, but I knew it was the path to get me into the industry I wanted to be in. And then I realized the commission checks were so great. And I <laughs> was like, this is awesome. Um, so I stayed, you know, stayed the course for a long time. But my transition to marketing was kind of a, um, I had actually been trying to build it for over 18 months and I've been pitching internally that what I was doing in group sales and I was able to eventually help um, impact some of our individual game sales because there is a little bit of a gray area between group sales per se and individual sales. So I was kind of helping toe the line between the two. So as I had started to do that, I built, a, you know, I kind of presented my case like, hey, I, you know, I have an interesting perspective. Number one, I know everything about the sales process. I know how we do renewals. I know how we do, you know, season ticket on sale. I know all the group, I know all of the details of the inner workings of what goes on up here. And I said, the most important thing for us is to have a cohesive, you know, sales and marketing team. So if I was to be in marketing um, and I have that degree and I have that background, I can connect the dots for us. So my official title when I first went down there was the director of ticket marketing. Um, so my job was really kind of, you know, bringing the two departments together and keeping um, marketing on track to the specific key goals. So, you know, one of the key things that, um, that I was put in charge of was saying, okay, 
you know, we know season ticket renewals come up every year at the same time, but for some reason, every year at the same time, it's like all chaos breaks loose because we got to get this thing out the door. Well, we know it's going to happen at the same time every single year. So, you know, it was connecting the dots and saying, okay, like, hey, sales, this is the marketing timeline. This is how long it takes creative to do these things. This is how long it takes our printer to print these things. Like, let's build a plan backwards to say, okay, we need to start talking about this at this time so that we can get it out the door at this time. So, you know, it was, um, I built the plan for myself to get down there. And then once I was down there, it, it became this really amazing opportunity for the two departments to work together because, and I actually sometimes got caught in the middle, like, well, you know how long it takes to create things and they want it to work. I'm like, okay, time out, time out. Like, let's figure this out. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I, I transitioned. And it, and it worked out well that, and I shouldn't say worked out well because it was sad to, leave, to lose the thrashers, but in the whole transition, there were a lot of moves and things happening. And so me moving into that role was great. Um, ironically, that was two days before I had my first child too. So it was oh, a wow. whole... And, and it was during an NBA lockout, too. It was right before an NBA lockout. So there was lots of things going on at that time. Not much. Not much. <laughs> no, but I've always, I've always said that the sales team and the marketing teams really need to work well together. Because a lot of times, I mean, you could have a great creative team and marketing team. And, but if they're not on the same page with, you know, the best way to generate, um, you know, more leads or ways to drive, um, sales. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it, it makes it rough on the sales team. So, um, I thought it was kind of cool that you went from the sales to that because you know exactly what, you know, you would want as a sales rep and a director there. So mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. Um, cause you don't see that often. Absolutely. Well, it's important that you have, and the way that I look at it is that you have your paid, media pieces speaking the same language as your you know word of mouth marketing pieces and if you think about a sales floor of 50 to 70 people which a lot of these professional teams have those are all word of mouth marketing pieces and if they're not speaking the same message as your paid media then there's just it's disconnected and you're not going to get as much bang for your buck then why are we paying you know why pay so it's just all got to be in cohesion and at the same time like we can't be marketing season tickets when we're not even selling them but you know it's it, all those little things and I know it sounds crazy but a lot of teams are not on the same page with what message is going out at what time and what their you know their word of mouth pieces are saying too yeah so how was transitioning from kind of the team side where you you have just you have to do you know the game days and you have all these you know long seasons to kind of you know the consulting and um spinzo like how how have you liked that transition it's, you know, it's totally different. Um, there's, you know, it's startup world, right? Spinzo is technically a startup. So one thing that I love about it that I also loved um, working on a team is that, you know, that instant impact, like you can make an impact and you can make things happen right away. Um, I think that's one of the things I love most about our industry. Um, and we don't, and there's a whole, there's a huge amount of red tape. But, you know, I will say we don't have um, the seasonality that we used to have, say, on the team side, because we have clients selling you know, and we actually, we have clients in the U.S., Canada, and Australia. So technically, oh, wow. you know, we have, our business is always open. So we'll get messages in the middle of the night from Australia. Like, so it's just, it's a different, it's a different world. Um, I think I, you know, being a startup and being a virtual, like a virtual startup, like I worked from home for Spinzo from the, the start, you know, um, I think that was the biggest difference for me. And the difference that I needed, you know, I needed that in my life. I needed a, a different, um, a different structure, a different set of accountability. Um, and I think it's interesting to watch how our industry has had to adapt to that because I've heard all sorts of different stories. And before it was never like, it was never okay to work from home in the sports world, you know? And there was that mentality if you walked out of the office at five, which eventually when I had little ones, I had to, it was like, oh, half day today, Denise. And it's like... Don't even like, do you even know what I dealt with before I got here at 9.30 or 9 o'clock? And then what I'm going to go do now before I get back on my computer at 8.30? You know, but, that, but that's, the, that's somewhat of the culture of the sports industry. And I think we're being forced right now, one of the great blessings of the situation that we're in, because it's, you know, you've got to find blessings in everything, is that hopefully the sports industry is going to be able to adapt to allow more people to work in it and work in ter under terms like this 
knowing that you can get your job done remotely. And then on a game day, for example, you can get your job done remotely before you have to go into the ballpark, the stadium, the arena, whatever it may be. Um, and there's a little bit more of that flexibility. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's definitely differences. I, what I love too now is that, you know, I'm not, um, I still get to have all my connections of the industry and, you know, I, I do, don't have those weekends or, you know, nights and I can actually sit and watch the games when I have a moment. Um, <laughs> you know what I've noticed though, just from, you know, I go back and forth, like I can go like, you know, three months working from home and then I just get like, I want to get out of the house. But what I've noticed in just even managing a sales team remotely is we're able to be a lot more efficient mm -hmm. and you, you really take, you know, I, I wouldn't say take for granted, but you, you overlook how much time is wasted in an office setting and how many distractions there are. And so it's, it, I definitely feel that, uh, you know, there's, there's pros and cons both ways. I was always a hardcore, like you have to be in the office. Like I want to be able to see everybody. I want to be able to, you know, like, but I'm starting to, maybe I'm getting older now and uh, you know, I'm like, <laughs> man, okay, we can be efficient. I mean, before COVID, I never hosted a zoom uh, meeting. Yeah. Now I've been on them, but now I've hosted probably a few hundred um, just in the last few months, just multiple you know, a day and um, there's with the technology, there's so many ways that you can, you know, communicate with, you know, fans or, or customers and, um, you know, even with, you know, virtual phones now, you know, all of our sales team had our phone system, they had an app on their phone so they can still make their calls. Um, so I think that there's probably going to be a lot more companies, not just sports that that look at that and look at it. I mean, it's a great way to be more efficient and save, save money. So. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I, you know, our industry has always been, you know, being in the office is a big part of it. And I, I mean, I'm sure you can, you have the same sentiment, but like, I can, can't even tell you how many meetings I sat in that I'm literally like, I will never get this hour and a half back of my life. And what did we accomplish? Like we, whereas like on zoom, like, you know, you can't sit and like, it's not as easy to waste time, you know, it's much more efficient and you can and move and get stuff done. And I feel like, you know, I get more done now in four hours working from home than I did in eight hours in the office. And to your point, it's the distractions of people jumping in your office and all of a sudden it's this, oh my gosh, did you hear what so-and-so said or did you hear what so-and-so And it's like, hey, I have stuff I have to get done. And if I don't get it done now, it means I'm doing it tonight at, at home and I don't want to. So, um, agreed with you there's totally pluses and minuses it does get you know a little bit lonely i'll say you know working from home um when you're all by yourself um but that's you know we do um obviously not right now but we have we do you know obviously travel to clients and see them and you know that's kind of you know i, I love that because that gets me back into the office office atmosphere and i love you know when i have downtime between our meetings and they sit me at a cube that's in the middle of the sales room like it brings back so many memories and i just like, sorry, we're so loud. I'm like, no, 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 I love this. Like, this is, I love being back in this atmosphere and seeing what it's like. So um, I think I get enough of a taste of that when we travel and see. Um, and I think that's another cool thing is that, you know, working for one team, I didn't get to see all the different setups and, and hear how all these other teams are doing what they're doing and being a part of it. And now I get to do that. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the great things that spins us that we can now share ideas and say, hey, you know, this, this team's doing this and maybe you should take a look at it or you should connect with so-and-so because they have something that's doing really, really well through our platform and you guys can be very successful at it too. So um, there's benefit in, in what I'm doing there too. So tell me more about Spinzo. What, what exactly do you guys do and what's your role there? Yeah, so in normal times, <laughs> we help teams sell group tickets and tickets in general. So our um, platform was designed in in the space of saying, okay, there were not very many great tools to do group sales really efficiently. And, you know, I think some of the ticket ticketing providers would tell you that they didn't spend time on it. So we were able to come in and create a really innovative platform that allows teams to do that. Um, my role is I'm the vice president of sales and service. So I oversee all of our sales efforts, all of our, you know, service retention. So, you know, I'm pretty much all of it, right? Um, <laughs> 
you know, but it's been fun to grow our business. We've grown probably slower than others in our space, which, you know, is everyone chooses their own way to grow, but we've grown through relationships and referrals. And it's been, um, this time has actually been a really great time for us because we've had a lot of teams that didn't have the time to look at us or look at the players in our space. And they've come to us and they've looked at us and they've, we've had conversations um, and we're going to be the beneficiary of a number of new clients because of this time frame. Um, so we do that. We also now during this time have launched a brand called Ticket Playbook. And that is a community that we've been building of industry professionals, mostly reps, managers, directors. Um, and we've been hosting discussion sessions around group sales and around sales topics. And as opposed to being a webinar where it's, you know, just so you're spoken to um, and you don't have a lot of interaction, this is literally a live Zoom. And we have anywhere from 75 to 150 people on these on a weekly basis. And people are sharing ideas like, hey, here's what wow. we do. Here's how we do. Hey, you know, does anybody work with so-and-so? And we try to keep it topic-based. So for example, tomorrow we have one around corporate groups and how do you work with your corporate partnerships department? Next week, we're going to have one about heritage nights. We've had one about faith and family nights. And so our goal is to grow this community and we're going to be in the coming weeks coming out with some new things that are going to enhance this community um, as a way of just continuing to give back. Like we are in the sports space. We want to be seen as, um, you know, an expert, as a connector, as, um, as a company that people can look to as an innovator in the space. Um, and, you know, we're excited about continuing to do that. Now for those Zoom calls that you guys do, is that exclusively for your your clients or are you kind of opening that up to anybody in you know those roles it's open to anyone um we have uh people that are aspiring to get into the industry that are jumping in and just listening and seeing who the talkers are and then reaching out to them and saying hey would you be open to an informational interview i'd love to get in the industry i'd love to hear more about what you do um we have managers and directors and vps on the calls we have reps on the calls um it really varies all across the board and i would say over half are probably not our clients. Um, we've had conversations with some of those that um, are not our clients because they are like, wait, you're doing all this? And we, what, do, what do you guys do? Tell us more. Um, and it's really, every week, is, it's not an infomercial about Spenzo. Some of our clients will come on and they'll talk about some of the tools that they use that have been successful for us. But that's not the goal of it. The goal is to create a community and to create, uh, the way I like to see it is some normalcy. <laughs> Let's talk about normal things about our business in a time that's so not normal. And now we're starting to see even people that have been laid off or furloughed, they're joining the call because they're continuing to work on their craft while they're, yep. you know, in their, in their break period. And as sad as that is, you know, those are the people that are going to come back stronger and faster when we do um, come back and ramp up. Cause I have a feeling that, you know, we've gone from uh, 60 to zero. We went overnight from 60 to zero. I feel like we're going to go from zero to 60 overnight too in this industry. Yeah. And, but that is the, a great way for you guys and yourself to continue to build relationships with non-clients. Like, look, Absolutely. you, you are genuine. And when you're genuine, you know, it will, it will come back. So, I mean, I think that's great. I mean, it's, you can, you'll never know everything in this industry. Uh, I don't care how long you've been in it or, or what role. I mean, everyone has to continue to learn and adapt because, you know, I'm sure when you started with Spinzo till now, there's probably been a lot of changes just in, you know, the way tickets are, are sold and groups and things like that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, it's point, it's moments like this that you think about to your point that you're never going to know everything. Like there's no playbook for what we're going through right now. Like, you know, if you're a VP of a team, like, how, you know, you have no idea what to do. And we, we talked to some of our clients and they're like, you know, it's like, have you mapped out your venue? And they're like, no, because guess what? I don't know what my governor or my mayor or, what, you know, if I knew what they were going to say next week, then I would. But, you know, there's, everyone's going about it in a different way. And there's just so many layers to it. And I think you have to be a constant student in any industry, in any job that you're in to be able to, you know, continue to evolve. Because if you continue to do it the way that you've always done it, I promise you, you're going to be in last place eventually, right? So oh, you've got to continue to evolve. How often do you do the calls? Is it once a week? We've been doing once. It's once a week, sometimes every other week. It just depends okay. on scheduling. Um, we try to get at least someone, you know, whether it's a client or a non-client, that's a little bit more of an expert or has some best practices to rely on for the conversation. Um, but yeah, no, we're, we're trying to maintain them as much as we can weekly, just being cognizant of, you know, holidays and those types of things. 
have you, did you just start this during COVID or was this something pre COVID as well? Great question. So we ticket playbook, the brand was started before COVID and okay. our, our vision for that was totally different. It was to be like a one-stop shop for training and, you know, group sales, best practices and, and information. And now it's evolved into this community. Um, and so we, when we first jumped into, into this COVID world, um, we actually, we have a partnership with Sports Business Solutions and we did a webinar with them. And that webinar had almost a thousand people on it. We were talking about the state of group wow. sales and it was myself, um, Ben Neistat and Carl Manto and Bob Hammer. And it went really, really well. And we we're like, wow, people like, there's a clamoring for this type of information and have this conversation. And so um, actually one of a rep that was at um, one of our clients um, who unfortunately has left the industry by choice um, was posting something about, hey, I wanna have a discussion about faith and family nights. Can we all get together and talk faith and family nights? Who's in? And the response he got was amazing. And I said, hey, like Patrick, we'd love to, we've been talking about doing this. I'd love to jump in and help you run it. Like we can build a registration form. We'll get everyone, everyone can just get on and do this discussion. I'll kind of be the moderator. You start to have the conversation, ask the questions. And from that, it started. And, and people keep tuning in every week. I mean, I'm humbled and shocked by the fact that we have 75 to 150 people that tune in every single week. And a lot of them are the same faces. Some are new faces based on, based on timing. But the, if they keep coming back, we're going to keep doing it. And that's what I keep that's saying. Awesome. People, like, yeah. hey, as long as you keep coming back and you guys want to have these conversations, we're going to continue to have them. So where, how do you join it? How do you find out about it? Yeah, so if you go to ticketplaybook.com, um, if you go there, you'll see a registration link for our next, um, or sometimes there's multiple registration links there, but right now the registration link is, for example, for tomorrow, which may be too late by the time this airs, um, is there, but we're going to have one on August 26th about Heritage Nights. Um, so the link for that will be up later today, if not tomorrow. Um, so you can just go ahead and click, log in um, and um, register, and then you'll get the link for the Zoom. And all you do is join the Zoom and, you know, it's, it's a live Zoom like this and we'll, you'll see, you know, four or five screens of faces or names because a lot of people don't put their camera on, which, come on. <laughs> Make it mandatory. No. <laughs> you to go to the office. Come on. Like, I don't care if you're in your sweatshirt or t-shirt. Like, yeah. it's a good time. Um, and then you can just chime in. You can ask questions. You can chime in the chat. Um, and then you'll hear from a lot of different people. And the great thing is that people have been making connections outside of it. And that's the goal is like, we have everyone chime in when they um, jump onto the call, just so they can say, hey, you know, I'm Denise Sicken at Armas Finzo or whatever team you're with, just so that you can network following the call, because we don't want the conversation to end here. You know, if you guys have a great idea, or you hear a great idea, you may want to reach out to that person from the Tigers or from the Panthers or whoever it may be and have that further conversation. What's kind of the craziest um, promotion that you've seen? you know, either when you were on the team side or through Spinzo. <laughs> so the craziest promotion that I was a part of was our, was the swipe right night that the Atlanta Hawks did. So I was in the marketing team when we um, put that night together. That was when back in the early infancy days of Tinder and our CEO, Steve Coonan, um, he is a very creative gentleman. He was pushing us. This was one of the first years I think that he was at the team he was pushing us to be really creative. And he's like, we need to do a Tinder night. And we were all like, Oh, you know, okay, are you, are you, are you sure? Like, you know what Tinder is? Like we were, so we put this together, we put together swipe right night. And the funny story is, is that we, um, the night was planned for like right after New Year's day. And so during the time frame, like in basketball, we were able to take some breaks based on our scheduling. And so we had had a pretty big break around New Year's day. We came back cause we had put this out on our website and our PR guy comes into the meeting and goes, um, we have over a hundred media requests for this night, people that want to be on site. And we were like, <laughs> you know, like we got to make sure this looks, you know, like perfect. And so um, it was really fun. It, it was a lot of, you know, like just creative thinking, thinking outside the box. Like we went and bought, you know, I had a, a girl, my staff buying roses to put in the suite that we had. We were buying mints, you know, we kind of like in gum and we were, it, we were just having fun with it. And it um, ended up being a pretty big success. Um, from a standpoint of the media coverage that we got. That was national well. news. I, rem I, I remember know, that. I know. Yeah. I know. To be a part of a promotion like that, that, that gets national news is pretty fun. Um, and to be, you know, on the ground, scrambling to make everything happen. Um, it was, it was pretty fun. How did it work out on um, just from the business standpoint, as far as ticket sales and like actual participation? Yeah. So there was a lot of participation. I will say like, 
direct ticket sales to it. That wasn't the ultimate goal. The goal was okay. to make a splash and to Just be more okay. of a wow moment. Um, I believe they've evolved it and they've been able to drive some more ticket sales from it since then. Um, but it's been a few years since I was there. Uh, but our goal was really to get, you know, a wow. It was the wow factor. And it was... Oh, and you got it. That's... <laughs> we got it. We got it. But it was interesting that night. So we had cheerleaders going around and kind of seeing, like, who was making connections. And we picked a couple that, like, the best connection. And they got upgraded to a different suite and highlighted them on the, on, you know, in on the Jumbotron. It was really yeah. cool. Um, and I know in later years, they actually had a couple that met at one of their nights. So they even paid for their wedding. I want to say the Hawks paid for their wedding. Um, wow, they that's met and they had got, you know, they had, had a great relationship and they paid for the wedding. So it can happen, right? If people can meet on a reality TV show, why can't they meet at a game? Yeah. Yeah. They should have got married at the game too. Hopefully they did. I think they did, but I don't know all the details. because I've been trying my, my whole career is to get somebody to get actually married at halftime of one of my games and I haven't been able it. to find anybody. So I had a season ticket holder when I worked for the pirates that got married at the ballpark. Yeah. So during the game though, I want to say it was before the game. Okay. And then she had her like reception in yeah. one of those like party oh, areas cool. during the game. It was yeah. pretty cool. She was, a, she was a diehard. She was a diehard. How about like most successful campaign that you've seen as far as maybe from like moving the needle business wise with any of the teams that you're working with or actually in involved with? Yeah, so great question. So um, I would say from the standpoint of like what we've done with Spinzo, one of the big success stories we've had is um, we helped an NFL team that had a corporate partner program that they were, you know, selling some tickets to some of their sponsors um, and they were doing okay with it. Um, but I think a couple of things that they were missing was branding. So if I am a employee of Amazon per se or Starbucks or whatever it may be, you know, my page that I'm buying my tickets from looks and feels like my company. I feel like this is an exclusive offer to me. So we help this team transition all of their pages to that. Um, even companies that they weren't able to ever sell to before were finally on board because it didn't look like it was pushing just the, the team's agenda. It was actually really a huge benefit for their company. And so we quadrupled that um, program for them in one year. Um, so it went from under 200 grand to over $800,000 for that team in one season. So I would say that's probably one of the biggest like move the needle moments um, that, um, that I've been a part of on this side. I'd say on the team side, um, it's hard to pinpoint one thing. I think one of the things that um, when I was came into Atlanta, we really had to change process and programs and people. And so the, the combination of changing those three things, I was able to, when I first started in Atlanta, we were doing less than $2 million in group sales for the two teams. Um, by the time I transitioned, we were doing over 6 million. Um, and that was a matter of four years. And so it wasn't necessarily one specific program. It was streamlining a lot of things. One of the things that we were really successful at though, um, I will say, now that I think more about it, is we did an all staff sales blitz. And so we took the technology at the time that Ticketmaster had, and now through a platform like Spinzo, it's much easier to do this. But every single employee had their own link to push out to the marketplace and to all their friends and family. And it was over the course of three days. And then we also sold some donation packages that were really successful as well. And we brought in about a quarter of a million dollars in a matter of three days through that program every year. And so, you know, while that was three of the most stressful days of my life, because <laughs> um, I managed a lot of it, it was very, very successful. And, um, you know, I know there's, we, there's teams that we work with that still do those types of programs today um, that are very, very successful. So with Spinzo now, it's still a relatively small company, right? As far as staffing. Yep. So most likely teams are going to deal directly with you? Most likely, yes. So more often than not, I'm, I'm their one-stop shop. Um, but we're, yeah, we're a smaller company. Um, we, we like it that way. And the reason we can be that way is so much of what we do is automated. Our platform is truly self-service for our clients. So they don't necessarily need us, um, but we're here to help. So we do the onboarding process, we do the training process, and then we're as hands-on as our, our clients want us to be. What kind of features or anything kind of separates you guys from anything else kind of out there on the market now? Yeah, I think in our space, a couple of things that separate us. Number one, I think, um, is the customization. So our platform is really white labeled. 
So our teams can, you know, brand them any way, shape, or form that they want, and they can change that branding promotion by promotion. So whether they have a Star Wars night or whether they have a nurse's night, or it's just, you know, something I talked about with like, the corporate, that's, that's really important. And that white labeling goes all the way down to like the credit card statement. So it's going to say the team and where in their city, um, their email is going to come, it's going to look like it's coming from that team. It's going to have that same branding. So those are really key things in a world where people get nervous about where they're buying and if their tickets are right. legit. Um, a couple other things is just some of the like streamlined ways that our platform is built. So we have um, for that corporate partner program I talked about, we have a, um, a system called affiliates. And basically it allows you to make a carbon copy of a promotion but brand it a different way, assign it to a different rep and track, you know, everything from the conversion process. So the views, the number of buyers, all of that detail. Um, so that's another big thing. And I think for, from a reporting perspective, we have some really innovative reporting. We have our own heat map for each one of our clients on our platform so they can see exactly where their buyers are coming from in their market. Um, you can, you know, take that down to a group level. You can take that down to nice. a, a game level. Like there's just some really innovative things that we've done from a reporting perspective that allow our clients to, um, you know, to see what's going on and to make decisions based on, on the reporting there. And then of course they get to work with me, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, extra plus. <laughs> extra plus, right? Plus plus. <laughs> so how do you see, you know, our industry, you know, over the next six to 12 months with, with regards to, um, you know, Spinzo and just, you know, how we sell tickets and kind of rebound. Yeah, that's a million dollar question, I think. Um, you know, if I had a crystal ball and had all the answers, that would be great. But I think a couple of things that I, that I feel like um, are likely, like I said earlier, I think that when we come back, you know, it's going to come back fast and teams are going to have to be quick and agile to be able to sell tickets, as many tickets as they can, as fast as they can. Um, you know, I think in the, in the short term, there's going to be situations with social, social distancing. Um, we have some tools that we can help teams with for that too, that we've been working on. So there's that. Um, you know, I think that, I think you're going to see teams relying on platforms like Spinzo. You know, you've, you've laid off or furloughed a huge amount of staff. You don't have a lot of revenue coming in initially. So how many can you bring back, right? So where can we fill in the gaps or help or make things very efficient until you can go back up to a full staff? So I think those are some of the things that I think. I think also consumers, consumers are going to want more flexibility, right? You don't know. You don't know what's going on. So I think you're going to see things like flex plans. Um, being very popular and, and being, you know, things that, that teams are going to need to sell because buyers are going to want that. And I think eventually, like, groups are going to come back with a, you know, with a vengeance because people are going to want to get together in a group, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Like, think about all the groups that you're a part of that you haven't been able to see, like, even your church, your, um, your school groups, like, for example, you know, kids that want to do sports, like, you haven't seen your, your teammates. And there's going to be a desire to have those interactions when we feel safe to do so that I think those are gonna come back in a big, big way. So I think we have to be patient, you know, and it's tough, it's hard, it's painful to watch and see friends and colleagues lose, you know, their their jobs, their teams shutter, their company, like company shutter, and that's yeah. really, really painful. But I think that um, in the long run, we're gonna come back stronger as an industry. And, you know, I think the conversation about, you know, working remotely and, and working in a different way that's more efficient and effective um, will be prevalent in our industry too. Yeah. And I, I've been saying it for the last few months. Um, I think the teams who continue to build and put effort in now are going to come out so much better. I know a lot of teams are cutting because the revenues aren't there, but I mean, now is the time to continue to build on those existing relationships and um, reach out. There's people still buying. I mean, on the ticket side, I, I get that, uh, mm -hmm. from groups and things, but you know, when I was with the baseball team, we were still selling season tickets. We were still selling mini plans, um, throughout this whole process. And you have to obviously be able to identify who's, who's able to be closed and who is just, let's, let's keep building that relationship with. But I, I really think the teams that are sitting back, not doing anything right now um, are going to be in a world of pain once things open up. Cause I mean, it takes, it's going to take time to build a pipeline back up. Absolutely. So, and I think you have two choices in a situation like this, you can either retract 
and you know kind of go you know kind of go into go into your shell um or you can come out and you can just you know continue to move forward and i think to your point you know that's the choice that we've taken at spenzo is that we and that's what ticket playbook has become is that you know hey we don't have all the answers but we're going to be a facility for people to talk and and we're going to yep. be forward facing and we're going to keep innovating and we're going to keep having conversations and we're not going to shy away from reaching out to people to talk about a demo conversation right now because and I am, I'm having those conversations because there will be a time when we come back and they're going to be ready yeah. and they're going to need our platform more than ever. So, um, you know, you have two choices. And I think, you know, to your point, I think we're both on the same page that, you know, yeah. being proactive and being out there is really, really important right now. Well, and that's what I like about your your video series, your the, the playbook. I mean, it's great. I mean, if you just, you know, sit back and wait for people to rebound and want to call you. Um, and this is a great way just to, to help everyone helping everyone. And I think that's the cool thing about our industry is, you know, you, you genuinely have that, you know, people want to help each other. And this is a great time for us to show that. And um, it's exciting. I mean, I, obviously I want to get more games going and get the, the fans back in the stands. Um, so uh, but no, it's, it, I, I agree with you though. I, I think it's going to come back stronger and, um, you know, just hopefully everybody's ready when it does, cause it could be very quickly. It could be very quickly. Yeah. And that's, and that's the crazy thing. So you have to always be prepared because we don't know what's, what's around the corner. Well, Denise, I want to thank you for joining me. It was, it was great yeah. chatting with you, um, learning more yeah. about, you know, how you manage everything and, and how you've grown, you know, Spinzo as well. Cause I see, I see people on LinkedIn all the time, you know, posting about it and Thank see you. you out at the different cities. So keep up the good work. Thank you. And it was so great to, to chat with you and thank you for inviting me to be a part of your podcast.